Accelerationism is back, and it's even more embarrassing than the last time. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the Fury podcast. This is Adam, of course, joined by Craig, and returning champion one Matty Colhoun, to talk about the phenomenon of what happens when interest rates drop too low for too long, which is effective accelerationism. The new hit techno optimist manifesto put out by Marcus Andreessen, the co founder of Netscape, one of the earliest internet uh, browsers overtaken later on by Internet Explorer, and now head of the Marcus, well, the Andreessen Horowitz uh, venture capital firm. And they put out a new manifesto, which is sadly blowing up all the usual channels under the name of Effective Accelerationism. What is effective accelerationism? What is accelerationism? A term with many accelerationisms as there are effects of it. Well, to answer these, of course, myself, Craig and Matty are going to be tackling the core of accelerationism and then we'll be getting into the meat, if you can call it that, of Marcus Andreessen's manifesto, which is called the Techno Optimist Manifesto. Zipwise. Matty, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. Always a pleasure. Okay, so let, let, let's kick off by defining our terms here. What is accelerationism? Or what was accelerationism? Because we've had so many. You've got gender accelerationism, unconditional, left, right. I mean, we covered some of this ages ago, but even then I still think we haven't gotten into the, the weird multiplicity of what all the act is. It's, uh, it, yeah, it's changed a lot over the years, and I guess it, just, it feels like ancient history now. But it was only sort of five years ago that these debates felt like they were really, really active online. And then it all faded away because everyone just got a bit too embarrassed of where it was ending up. Um, which is notably, I think that's what's so interesting about this effective, effective accelerationism. What I guess killed accelerationism proper was that, um, was the sort of terroristic version, the white nationalist version, um, where it was getting quoted. And, um, and referenced in all kinds of um, yeah terrorist manifestos, and now we've got a manifesto that makes even makes me miss even those ones in a weird way because there's just nothing to it whatsoever. Um, I think I did want to to define accelerationism. I guess there was two old quotes that I wanted to pull out that I think still hold up. Um, I think on my blog, Zenogothic, still the most read post I think that I have on here is, is the UAC primer that I wrote a few years ago um, and at the very start there's yeah two quotes that have now sort of faded out into the, the into the, the, the churn of discourse and one is actually from the old Wikipedia page which used to be quite good on accelerationism and isn't anymore um, but there was one that's this line that says um, some contemporary accelerationist philosophy starts with the deleuze guattarian theory of deterritorialization, aiming to identify, deepen, and radicalize the forces of deterritorialization with a view to overcoming the prevailing tendencies that, that suppress the possibility of far-reaching social transformation. Um, which I think is, is, is a really good and if, if sort of technically dense way of summarizing it. And I think it's the same line that Mark Fisher used to talk about and Mark has this essay on Nick Land, who I'm sure we'll come back to at some point, called Post-Capitalist Desire, um, which is the essay and not the collection of um, Mark's final lectures. And um, they're sort of based on the same thing. But there, and I'll sort of I'll pass over the baton after this already, but Mark has this great definition, I think, where he says, capitalism is a necessarily failed escape from feudalism which, instead of destroying encasement, reconstitutes social stratification in the class structure. It is only given this model that Deleuze and Guattari's call to accelerate the process makes sense. It does not mean accelerating any or everything in capitalism willy-nilly in the hope that capitalism will thereby collapse. Rather, it means accelerating the processes of destratification that capitalism cannot but obstruct. And as far as I can tell, effective accelerationism does nothing remotely resembling like that. <laughs> mm, completely agreed, especially with the relationship to, to technology, I guess. I mean, when thinking about, I mean, the research I'm, I did for the 
introduction to Mark Fisher's like PhD thesis, Flatline Constructs, re- revolved around really sinking myself into like, this CCRU era material, the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit, which was the sort of power academic uh, group collective milieu around Warwick University in the 90s, where you get, you know, if listeners don't know, people like Sadie Plant, Nick Lan, Kojo Eshen, Mark Fisher, of course, Anna Greenspan, um, you know, plenty of folks who go on to found like, Urbanomic and the likes like that, as well as a lot of the early Zero Books people as well. And what's so interesting about what is accelerating in, in accelerationism as it's first sort of formulated in the 90s, is it's one straightforward, it's a theory of time, but what it, it basically relies on two key things, one, a theory of time, and two, this sort of deleuze guattari analysis of capitalism as something which is constantly uh, producing towards its own interior limit and then constantly displacing that limit. So for listeners, what this means is that essentially capitalism keeps commodifying more things and keeps making new frontiers to turn more things into commodities and find new ways to extract surplus value because it's constantly running down the clock to the limit of what it can extract. Eventually, it has to find new things to commodify, more people to displace, more things to liquidate in order to turn them into capital, more things to enclose. And ultimately, it, you know, for example, empires having to keep expanding for the gains of capital at the top. Uh, moving away from models of debt towards models of data, more ways of you know, using time to financialize the future in the forms of debt, for example. And you, you can see that capital is constantly trying to displace this limit, but it can't do it on its own. It needs, according to the accelerationists, this factor of what the and Guattari called anti-production. It needs these compensatory, the most negative feedback mechanisms to keep the system from uh, basically running too fast. Because if it runs too fast, it hits its limit even faster, and then it risks completely colliding. And for, I mean, the example the CCIU give really tells us back into this theory of time they have, because the theory of time that they have this is from Anna Greenspan's thesis, is that the particular way in which capitalism technically measures time is through clocks and calendars and the symptoms of the clock and the calendar in sort of the, what Marx would call the struggle over the working day. That technological development of timekeeping technology is not only a time-producing technology, but it also corresponds to a particular kind of subjectivity, which is inaugurated philosophically in Kant's philosophy, namely Kant thinking that time is the main principle of subjectivity, the main condition of our experience, and therefore for Kant, the production of time is the limit of all our experience of the world. Greenspan and the CCIU's argument is that this Kantian production of time, which happens at the same time as our revolutions in the production of temporal measuring technologies, and the shift of basically how much people can demand and measure of one another's time. Now, they're writing this in the 90s, where this fusion of theoretical timekeeping, mechanical timekeeping, and capitalism are reaching an ever greater convergence. Because what is the thing which regiments all the communications, all the political operations that go into structuring the working day, the limit between work and play? It is computers. In the 90s, capital is digitizing everything. And it does this within its own internal timescale, by which I mean every computer, which you know, financial instruments use to communicate across global scales, which um, production chains from you know naval to literal logistics requires all requires instant communications, telecommunications, and computations. And all of these computations have in them a little clock. The problem was with whilst with these clocks in the nineties that. The way that clocks registered years was they only had the last two digits of that year. So, for example, the year 1999 would be registered in the computer as 99. And this was fine for a time because they were running, they were meant to be replaced. But as the clock was running down towards 2000, this was what Greenspan called a literal time bomb. Because Essentially, if it run down to zero, one and zero would mean the same thing. This is the Y2K problem. And it's not that they thought this was necessarily going to happen, the CCRU, but the fact that it could, the fact that there is a limit now built into the capital system through the very ways in which it's interacted with technology and become allied to technology in order to expand itself, means that if we ally ourselves with certain technological productive forces, 
and indeed imaginative and political forces, we can then accelerate the process such that capital hits its own limit, explodes itself, before the forces of negative feedback, anti-production, can save it from itself. This is kind of the key of the act. And then after this, of course, we get Fisher splits off, does more of a left accelerationism in the form of capital can't provide the things it wants to give us, and therefore we need to, to communize these productive processes for social ends rather than capital's ends. That's just the, the red plenty, the left accelerationism argument developed by Shiona Shek and Williams. And then we have uh, Nick. Nick Land, one of the founders of Acceleration, who what he brings to the table in the CCRU is really this, I, I think, maybe you disagree on this, Matty, this focus on intelligence. Because capital and the market aren't just vectors for the productive processes, they are data gathering. You find out what people want, you can produce what people want, and then develop uh, productive processes based on markets. And markets, much like Andreessen actually says in this manifesto, are intelligent. Uh, they are intelligence. They create intelligence. They create knowledge about desire and about production. They create so-called competitive gains. They produce technology. And that's the vehicle which land wants to accelerate even beyond the human itself. I think this question of intelligence accelerating that versus capitalist you know, general technological acceleration is going to be one of the main points we have to sort of think about going through this manifesto today. Cool. I guess I'll say a few things now. I, I just want to take it back to Deleuze and Gattari because I think they are the progenitors of this idea of accelerationism. It might even be worth reading the fragment from Anti-Oedipus out loud to keep it fresh in our minds. And then from there, you know, examine a few of the tendencies that splintered off. So I, I'm actually on the, the Wikipedia page right now, which uh, features the, the quote from Anti-Oedipus. Um, they write, but which is the revolutionary path? Is there one to withdraw from the world market, as Samir Amin advises third world countries to do, in a curious revival of the fascist economic solution? Or might it be to go in the opposite direction, to go still further, that is, in the movement of the market of decoding and deterritorialization? For perhaps the flows are not yet deterritorialized enough, not decoded enough from the viewpoint of a theory and a practice of a highly schizophrenic character, not to withdraw from the process, but to go further, to accelerate the process. As Nietzsche put it, in this matter, the truth is that we haven't seen anything yet. And that's probably the contentious line here is, what is it that we haven't seen? You know, what is the nature, what is the strand within the social that is to be accelerated? in order for us to achieve the aim of liberation from capital and its current instantiation. Uh, of course, we talked about Nick Land, the idea of a, a techno-singularity, you know, stripping itself out of the domain of the human into the post-human. Um, but I think it might be important to go back to where Deleuze and Deleuze and Gattari, particularly Deleuze, where he picks up this idea of... Um, accelerationism and it's in Nietzsche's the will to power and unfortunately on the uh, the accelerationism article on Wikipedia they feature that quote as well and Deleuze goes into this rather deeply in an essay called um, uh, oh geez we're going to do an episode on it uh, on nomad thought and um, I, I really suggest if you want to sort of develop your own interpretation of accelerationism, that would be the place to, to go, in, in my opinion, because I think it extrapolates this quote a little bit better. But Nietzsche writes in The Will to Power that the leveling process of European man is the great process which should not be checked. One should even accelerate it. And now the question is, what does Deleuze do with this in Nomad Thought? Well, I think some of the interlocutors or the the figures that he has in mind, of course, are Marx and Freud in, you know, as the masters of suspicion. And then, of course, with Nietzsche in tow, too, this idea that what we understand to be the encoding mechanisms or apparatuses, you know, theoretically, materially within Western society are capital our domination, our paternal domination through the family. And these, this is what we find out through readings of Freud and Marx and so forth. And, you know, of course, there is this plethora of accelerationisms, everything from gender accelerationism, like we said, to right-wing forms of market acceleration, uh, accelerationism. And I don't know, um, 
you know, us on Acid Horizon. I, I think people tend to confuse us with the idea that that we still cleave to some notion of le- left accelerationism. Although there is something within the fragment that I think merits some examination is what is an opposite direction look like? What is it that we really haven't seen? What has been the challenge uh, to overcoming capital in its current iteration? Um, and when, when I look at what Nietzsche is saying and, and, and thinking about what I would call Deleuze's later abolitionism, the one thing that capital does to all of us is that it not only, of course, uh, exploits us, you know, expropriates our, the surplus value of our labor and so forth, but it peels back the layer on what Deleuze and Deleuze and Qatari would call our minor becomings. And it exposes us to a minor politics. And in the displacement that occurs through capital, it deposits us into this field of other minor, minor becomings where we have um, the, the possibility of a kind of political solidarity that brings together an assemblage of people who might hail from different uh, nations, societies, social groups, religions, and so forth, and exposes these deterritorialized elements and puts them into a milieu. And it's in that space that that I think you know, we could potentially hack our subjectivity, as it were, or, or at least realize that the figure of subjectivity that put forward by the Western tradition of philosophy is illusory, at least in terms of the kind of insistent solidity that's often ascribed to subjectivity, and shows that what we understand as subjectivity is something that's constantly being decoded and deterritorialized. And so I, I think the question is, when it comes to a politics of the working class, the politics of gender, and so on and so forth. How do those minor becomings all intersect? You know, what is the sort of alchemy that brings all of that together in order for us to effectuate some kind of revolutionary movement? That's a question that I'm still interested in, despite the fact that I think I've I've disavowed some of these older accelerationisms. I think there's like a really interesting tension that comes from all of that. And I guess there's two things that I guess you both said that <clears throat> And there's also even in this EAC manifesto, um, because I guess I would like, well, I haven't really thought about it for a few years, I suppose, but I guess I would still nominally place myself on the left accelerationist trajectory. And that's probably just as a sort of Mark Fisher disciple. But um, I think what Mark comes to in in the the sort of the, 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 the last of his unfinished lecture, lecture series on his capitalist desire, the way he's looking at Leotard, um, is this sense of um, problematizing what it is that we desire um, and how our desires are shaped by economy, libidinal economy. Um, and I guess there's one ways in which, yeah, the way that, that this, this capitalistic reliance now on data um, kind of tells us who we are. Um, in a lot of ways, whilst giving the illusion that we can sort of shape that, um, that that illusion is nonetheless quite inspiring, and, it, and, it, and it, it reminds me of like the from a couple of weeks ago when everyone was getting their Spotify wrapped things, where you do just have this data that's been gathered on you, telling you what you like, which is revealing and, and interesting and fun. Um, but I kind of what I liked most is where there was that bit that went viral, where they would say, you know you have a lot in common with the tastes of someone from, was it like Burlington, Vermont or something? Um, but then the, what people did with that information is really interesting because then people, like I saw a few sort of TikTok reels of people like imagining Burlington, Vermont as like this utopia where everybody's like interested in sad bisexual music and loves autumn and all these kind of things. And there's something like it's funny, but there's something in that too, which I think is kind of at the heart of this, this 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 notion the left accelerationist notion of a post capitalist desire um that what if you know you 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 discover the things that you do like and what then if if you kind of uh, adhere to those desires they're given shape in data in and within markets that you know your your geopol- your geopolitical position could be determined by that kind of by those kinds of um attractions you know what if what if spotify unwrapped did produce a sort of socialist utopia in Burlington, Vermont. Um, those kind of questions I think are, you know, in a, a, a tongue in cheek version of, I think 
some quite serious implications of a lot of, of that kind of information. But at the same time, I think, is this sense that, and it's something that I think is what, what I found most bizarre about this manifesto too, is I guess there's the three quotes that it starts with. And one, the first one is from Walter Percy, or uh, Walker Percy, sorry, I don't know who that is. Uh, yeah, he has a novel called Lost in the Cosmos. I don't know. If right, okay. It's actually quite interesting, yeah. Um, but the line that they've pulled from, no, it's fine. The, the line that they've pulled from, from um, Walker is, uh, you live in a deranged age, more deranged than usual, because despite great scientific and technological advances, man has not the faintest idea of who he is or what he's doing. Um, and that feels like a very strange quotation to start a techno-optimist manifesto with. That sounds more like a kind of techno-nihilism, which is more aligned to an original accelerationism. You know, that, that, to me, sounds like something that you could pull from Ray Brassier. Um, Brassier's nihilism, which is, to quote him, nihilism not as an existential quandary, but as a speculative opportunity. Um, a kind of, uh, it, it precisely because, because of our science, it, it is because of our scientific advances that we are now so aware of the fact to, again, quote Brassier, that there is a mind-independent reality, which does, despite the presumption, presumptions of human narcissism, is indifferent to our existence and oblivious to the values and meanings which we would drape over it in order to make it more hospitable. Um, which I think kind of complicates, and I guess I'm, I'm presuming Adam will have more to say on this too, but this notion of intelligence that seems quite important to this EAG manifesto, um, where it's this kind of bizarre scientific, scientistic hubris almost, that you know, the more we advance scientific knowledge, then the more meaning we'll find in the world, when obviously the opposite is true, and we have to find that meaning where we you know, can take it from. Um, and for Brassier, what's important about that is this, 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 this kind of uh, destabilizing of meaning in a quite Nietzschean sense can lead us to destroy this sense of a manifest image, which is what Brassier talks about, quoting Sellers, but which you could just also call like common sense or social doxa. Um, so we could, you know, we, we could rethink the world without the baggage of, you know, of, of, of what has so far shaped it, which is above all else capitalism. Um, but this manifesto kind of goes in the opposite direction to that. It kind of starts with all the right ingredients where you have this interesting data that tells us maybe quite curious things about who we think we are or who we, or who we are or what could be. And at the same time is kind of frightened by a lack of meaning. Um, and so instead, instead of like facing up to that challenge, leans into you know, a sort of doughy-eyed, common or capitalistic sense, um, which makes it, you know, not a not an, a, an, an effective accelerationism in the way that the name suggests, but just a kind of normy accelerationism, um, an accelerationism that just wants to accelerate a normative view of the processes that govern and surround us. Whereas, you know, at the very first hurdle, that's kind of what makes this manifesto fall apart for me. It, it ejects that entirely. Um, and in a way, in, with, a, with a kind of like, also even like a quasi-religious language, even, in a way that, you know, like the, 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 the manifesto name checks Nick Land once or twice, I think. But I think even anyone vaguely familiar with Land's thought would just find, you know, it's even accelerationism's racist granddad would be embarrassed by this kind of utterly normative view of that, that raises questions, but then gives the most boring answers to them, um, mm. the most superficial answers to them. I, mean, I completely agree. I and mean, if you want to get into the, I mean, this, this, this manifesto is not very long, it has a table of contents. I'd like to I'd just read out the, 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 the table of contents here purely because it, it's so. Sort of, it summarizes itself quite a lot. I mean, so you have the first part is called lies, the second part is called truth, then it's technology, markets, the techno capital machine, which is where old Nick shows up, intelligence, abundance, uh, intelligence, energy, abundance, not utopia, but close enough, becoming technological supermen, technological values, the meaning of life, the enemy, the future, and patron saints of techno optimism. That list of patron saints, by the way. 
it's actually quite funny. But the first one is called um, Based Beth Jesus at Based Beth Jesus. And, you know, it's of course, of course. And then Nick Land is down there. Um, Nietzsche is down there. Nietzsche, of course, a huge fan of Technics, as we all know. Um, and let's just start it off in terms of looking at the, because it opens with lies and truth. It opens very clearly with what it thinks is wrong about the political state and our relationship to technology today. So I'm just going to read these parts out. So lies, we are being lied to. We are told that technology takes our jobs, reduces our wages, increases inequality, threatens our health, ruins the environment, degrades our society, corrupts our children, impairs our humanity, threatens our future, and is ever on the verge of ruining everything. We are told to be bitter, angry, bitter, and resentful about technology. We are told to denounce our birthright, our intelligence, our control over nature, our ability to build a better world. We are told to be miserable about the future. Truth. Our civilization was built on technology. Our civilization is built on technology. Technology is the glory of human ambition and achievement, the spearhead of progress and the, the realization of our potential. For hundreds of years, we properly glorified this until recently. I am here to bring the good news. We can advance to a far superior way of living and of being. We have the tools, the systems, the ideas. We have the will. It is time once again to raise the technology flag. It is time to be techno-optimists. I mean, it's I mean, first and foremost, the distinction between sort of living and being, living and being in the world, you know. It's interesting now, purely because uh, later on in the section called Energy, he says that energy is life. He defines life as energy. And he says that people, and he, he quotes someone here saying, people are the ultimate resource. And so the, the overwhelming thesis of this manifesto is everyone's saying technology is bad, it's destroying us. We need to basically accelerate every kind of technological advance possible because technology is if anything, it's almost kind of foyer bucky in a sense. It's like the species essence of man is intelligence and technology and our ability to use these things has to be, the, is, will solve all of our problems. This goes back actually, not even to a right wing or left wing tradition to some extent. It goes back to someone like Nikolai Fedorov. We did an episode on ages back and his idea of the philosophy of the common task, which was we have to accelerate technology so that we can bring back everyone who has ever died. And this is the only moral task. He thinks that science has shown us that death is not the end, and we need to make heaven on earth through accelerating our technological prowess. And anything other than that is a rejection of our duties to our, each other, particularly the federal of our families, and therefore that is the task. I mean, this is inspired, you know, uh, the Russian biocosmists in, the, in the, the, the Soviet Revolution, to some extent, tectologists as well. I mean, if anyone's seen uh, For All Mankind, that series, it's got a lot of Fedorov in it. This is kind of standard stuff. I mean, the theoretical references are mostly Nick Land's uh, Nietzsche, Nordhaus, Hayek, and uh, like Ray Kurzweil. I mean, let's just get to the part where he says accelerationism. He says, we believe in accelerationism, the conscious and deliberate propulsion of technological development to ensure the fulfillment of the law of accelerating returns. To ensure the techno capital upward spiral continues forever. Now, techno capital is this idea he's taken from land, where essentially market produces technology, technology produces new markets by freeing up new spaces for labor and creating new frontiers for commodification. Therefore, the market and technology enter a positive feedback loop where they just keep spiraling out infinitely on each other. For land, this would create um, an AI singularity. For, for Andreessen, he's very much rejecting land on this point. It's just a, a thing for human betterment. And when we say law of accelerating returns, this is basically what Ray Kurzweil says. He says, technological advances feed on themselves, increasing the rate of further advance. There's only one way and it's up. We're all going to make it, as the tech bros like to say. And the, the current field they've, they've fixed on with this, and this is where I think you can explain the effective aspect, is on this this so-called artificial intelligence technology, which is, one, well, of course, the big fixation of land. And here's another quote from the, the manifesto. We believe artificial intelligence is best thought of as a universal problem solver, and we have a lot of problems to solve. We believe artificial intelligence can save lives if we let it. Medicine, among many other fields, is in the Stone Age compared to what we can achieve with joined human and machine intelligence working on new cures. 
There are scores of common causes of death that can be fixed with AI, from car crashes to pandemics to wartime friendly fire. Of course, Mr. Andreessen not thinking about what Teslas do if you let them drive themselves. But I keep quoting, we believed any deceleration of AI will cost lives. Death that were preventable by the AI that was prevented from existing is a form of murder. And this is a fusion of the two big tech bro ideologies these days, which is long-termism slash effective accelerationism and, well, accelerationism itself. Effect effective altruism, sorry, not effective accelerationism. And this is the idea that if we give smartest people as much money as they ask for, then essentially they can keep investing for the long-term future of humanity beyond any immediate moral concerns right now, which will save the species and therefore save more people than anything we could do right now. It's Peter Singer's eugenicist sort of utilitarianism on steroids and infertile accelerationism is this, but on methamphetamines. It is um, truly this, this unity of we need to, if we accelerate technology, all of our problems will be solved. And if you're saying no to this, then you're saying no to the essence of humanity and therefore you are self-contradictory and so the machine can only ever go in one direction. I think, did I capture, do we think, the, the essence of this position here? I don't want to be, I don't want to be straw manning it, of course, but it's not a very, it's, it's mostly made out of, it's not exactly made of, you know, a thick material here. I, I think the strange thing, uh, you know, just thinking back to the accelerationist reader and seeing this, I, I, I want to ask you both, like, what do you think of the manifesto form as a way of invoking an accelerationism, especially given the idea that deterritorialization is, is the reason for the season? Because it seems like, like, what is a manifesto trying to do? Is it trying to establish a series of axioms uh, by which the, the future of accelerationism or techno-capitalism will be guided. It, it seems almost counterintuitive in a way because with the emergence of a techno-singularity, there's going to be so many unexpected phenomenon. This particular manifesto, uh, I was just trying to see like, what, what, what is really happening here? And what it is, it's the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People Taking Fang Numina from Behind, and, but like leaving in all the boring bits. And, and what's strange to me is that in as much as it attempts to espouse this distinction between what's true and what's false, many of the premises that are put forward are easily defeated by counterexamples. Even the tone of the manifesto just like quickly devolves into this kind of cringy pontificating. It, it reminds me of like when I was in eighth grade and um, your friend's entrepreneur dad came in to, you know, kind of level everybody with his like business ontology and tell you like the the virtues of being an entrepreneur and just being there on career day being the business guy that a lot of the platitudes here kind of smack of that you have that your your rugged individualism yeah, the the idea that there's a an ideological indifference in market behavior itself and it's it's basically Fang Newman infused with this kind of capitalist devotional that you'd find at your Barnes and Noble or like your Waterstones or something like that, or you know the philosophy section of the airport bookstore. But like another big thing is this is the manifesto. It, it comes pretty head on, unabashed with the racism. We'll, we'll get into some of the claims. There's one, and I forget which section it is, but the quote is. Atomic Energy Commissioner Thomas Murray said in 1953, for years, the splitting atom packaged in weapons has been our main shield against the barbarians. Now, in addition, it is a God-given instrument to do the constructive work of mankind. Murray was right, too. And so it, it evokes this theodicy of colonialism, you know, racism and, and so forth, and whose, who, whose gift and, and, and our birthright then is this God-given technology and, and all the potential that it contains within it. But I, I don't know. What do, you, what do you think of the manifesto aspect, Maddie? I, mean, I, I find it really telling. And I, I, it's, I mean, it's, it, it, it's so... It, it's it's I think that, what am I trying to say? I mean, it's, there's all these little sprinklings of references to things that sound kind of exciting. 
Like you, I mean, I think maybe the most obvious is just the the sort of nod to let to Nick Land. So it seems to like you know it, it wants to portray itself as kind of being like learned and, and and immersed in a lot of these quite provocative trends that have defined critical. Well, not it's, it's not even critical, um, but I guess thought <laughs> generically framed online in the past like decade or two. Um, but it's so much more reductive. Like it's like, you know, it doesn't feel like a Prometheus. So think about the manifestos that were, were, were kind of a staple of accelerationism in its various, in its variants. Each one had some kind of founding document that like, you know, put forward claims, but it, it's like, it's speaking out of both sides of its mouth to try and sound exciting and actually just be entirely sort of boring and familiar. Like it doesn't feel like a Promethean manifesto. It sounds more like a kind of, just a series of Protestant theses, and if that's and the, the, the quasi-religious language, especially, it feels Lutheran to me in a way that's like not remotely interesting. Um, and it's sort of like it's I kind of like the I mean the the, the framing of it as Fang Newman are taken from behind is is hilarious, but I feel like it's kind of not even it's it's there's no addition here to to like Landian thought. It's kind of pulling out everything that you could argue is remotely interesting about early land. Um, I think it's Dominic Fox who, um, as a kind of jibe at land, called his thought a kind of deluso Thatcherism, which again, I kind of like love that as a, as a, as a, as a sort of kind of pointed dismissal, really. But this doesn't even do that. The Deleuze isn't here. It's just, it's just Thatcherism. And I think that's most apparent in the mention of Nick Land. You know, they they they, they talk about they, they bring in Land to talk about this idea of a techno capital machine, but obviously there's kind of immediately obvious there's no sense of Land's sort of um, vestigial delusionism or deluso guitarianism in there. It's not a for them for Land a, 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 the reference to a machine is not a machine in the way that they're talking about as a technology. It's obviously the war machine. Um, and as Deleuze and Guattari talk about the war machine, this is kind of this 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 nomadism, this kind of peripheral um, uh, decentering of 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 of, of in, um, which they kind of pay lip service to in the EAC manifesto. Um, but war machines, as they say, are susceptible to capture. And this just feels like, you know, it's it's a machine in the most boring sense, in a very hamstrung sense. It's not got any um, uh, kind of decentralization within it. And I wanted to kind of go to that the section where they talk about decentralization in here because it's the most sort of, I mean, again, that, that, that other Deleuze Guattarian thing where they talk about, I think it's even part of the accelerationist fragment or, or at least close to it. Where they talk about, you know, capitalism will never die of its own contradictions. Nothing's ever died of its contradictions. But this is sort of the, the contradictions in this are so sort of tightly wound. It's just bizarre. Um, where does it say this? Um, we believe the market economy is a discovery machine, a form of intelligence, an exploratory, evolutionary, adaptive system. We believe Hayek's knowledge problem overwhelms any centralized economic system. All information is on the edges in the hands of people closest to the buyer. The center abstracted away from both the buyer and the seller knows nothing. Centralized planning is doomed to fail. The system of production and consumption is too complex. Decentralization harnesses complexity for the benefit of everyone. Centralization will starve you to death, which I would agree with in, 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 in essence, but then they kind of talk about, they immediately then go on to talk about, we believe in market discipline. The market naturalized, naturally disciplines, the seller either learns or changes from the buyer, or changes when the buyer fails to show or exits the market. When market discipline is absent, there is no limit to how crazy things can get. And if anything, if anything about this is acceleration, if, if, or if there's any sort of relationship to accelerationism here, accelerationism, even in its most vul vulgar sense, is a kind of affirmation of that final thing that they reject. It's a rejection of market discipline. So, so, so there is no limit to how crazy things can get so that capitalism may then, you know, morph into something else. So they kind of have this, like, pay this lip service to decentralization, which I guess is their fundamental belief that markets sort of stop the development of monopolies. Um, 
but at the same time, there's nothing else in this manifesto that su- that suggests any way of doing that. It sort of it, it feels so fundamentally confused as to what it's even trying to say. So, like all information is on the edges in the hands of the people closest to the buyer. That doesn't sound like the edge to me. The people closest to the buyer sounds like the sort of centre of a market economy. That's where you want to be. Um, the centre of stretches away from both the buyer and the seller knows nothing, which is surely kind of that is the sort of Promethean, even accelerationist place to be. You want to be, you want to be in that space where not where yeah you feel like you know nothing, where you have that sort of nihilism as a, as a space of opportunity. You know, what if all of our market information is all, you know, how we understand ourselves is wrong, what then becomes possible? Um, centralized planning is doomed to fail, the system of production and consumption is too complex. Yes, um, maybe, but then they're also saying that markets and data is what allows, you know, that, that's what makes markets have an artificial intelligence that's kind of beyond human intelligence. I think there's that, um, there's that great, is it Alex? I think it's Alex Williams and Nick Cernak on one, either both of them or one or the other. Um, I think it's in one of the collapse journals about high frequency trading, where high frequency trading takes sort of all information of say, like the 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 the, the market fluctuations of corn or crops. It will and it will take you know a computer can hold all inf- all recorded knowledge on the sort of ups and downs of the price of wheat um, over centuries in a way that humans just can't do, allowing it to sort of project to project and predict market dynamics in a way that we don't have access to, um, to allow you know trading to be done at, at a speed that goes far beyond human comprehension. That was something that really excited the initial accelerationists because it was it would humiliate the kind of already faux knowledge of economists who sort of see themselves as prognosticators when actually they, they don't know what they're talking about, only the machines do. Um, so then they, this manifesto says, decentralization harnesses complexity for the benefit of everyone. Um, that might be an accelerationist, a left accelerationist view, but obviously there's nothing here that demonstrates how they're going to do that. Um, it doesn't benefit everyone, it benefits a few. And there's lots, that, and I think that's some of the most galling parts of this manifesto are the bits where they really lean into the social utility of their sort of ideology in a way that just, you know, is pure Thatcherism that doesn't actually have any, you know, grounding in reality at all. That, you know, that the idea that free markets lift people out of poverty. Um, show me where. <laughs> um, and, 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 or at least show me where that is applicable to everyone. You know, obviously, there's the, if we can say anything, capitalism is dependent on, as you know, that Mark Fisher quote that I read at the start, it's dependent on class stratification. And so there are one time sort of seeing themselves as this kind of Nietzschean overman, um, that, you know, we are the technologists, we are the inventors of the future, rather than, you know, in that kind of classic big cat capitalist sense that, and just as and you know, as Elon Musk especially, you know, thinks he's an inventor when he just owns the means of production, he doesn't invent anything, he just buys things. Um anyway, yeah, that's it. There's it's, there's a mess. The other thing that I wanted to say, which is kind of related to this, um, this kind of you know, the so there's a little nod to the Lozenguatari via land, which doesn't seem to understand Lozenguatari at all. There's the same thing with these references to Nietzsche and this kind of um the, these references to what the uh, the uh, eternal, what's the Kurzweil thing? The um, but I think you just mentioned um, uh, yeah, which kind of feels like this capitalist version of the eternal return, um, which again is interesting. Like this, I think this like uh, it's it was so central to Deleuze and Guattari's philosophy. I know you've been doing a reading group for Nietzsche and philosophy um, on the channel. Um, or is that on the Zero Books channel? One of them. Um, there's this there's this fundamental confusion about that concept there, where you're kind of they're kind of picking some of the things cool Nietzsche, and sort of retooling and reducing that to something that's just overly familiar, which is economistic orthodoxy. Um, so there's this sort of evolutionary um, Darwinistic nod to natural selection. 
But Deleuze's whole point about Nietzsche's eternal return in a kind of like Groundhog Day way, right, is you know, if, if we're stuck in this ever, uh, ever repeating um, existence where we will ex- always experience the same things over and over again, the, the sort of paradox of the eternal return is that it forces you to, to enact a kind of a, a, a selective principle. Which is what Deleuze calls that kind of the kind of ethics of the return of return. If you're stuck in this sameness, how do you um, change your own sort of comportment to better not only your own existence but the existence of those around you? The kind of whole moral framing or ethical framing of Groundhog Day being, you know, you, you're stuck in the situation, and then you have to you, you select ways of not only for self improvement but improve the lives of those around you, and then you kind of you find difference within the endless repetition. Um, the law of the eternal return is that it kind of um, there's a, I can't remember the line now from um, Deleuze but it's like the um, despite appearances it will select for things that are wholly other to stasis and again there's like you know there's, there's an interesting accelerationist gambit in there that's what I used to like about unconditional accelerations and it kind of had this sort of stoic ethics of an eternal return make yourself worthy of the things that happen to you um, if you live in a kind of weirdly deterministic world like a capitalist society, where are the gaps that you can actually produce difference or, or difference is produced um, that then, you know, can shift that in radical, even paradoxical ways? This doesn't do any of that. <laughs> it, it, it pays this kind of really superficial lip service to it, but then leans repeatedly back into sameness into you know uh, uh, accelerating the re- a, a kind of a, the, what mark fisher would call the frenzied stasis of capitalism as it already is um uh, what you're excel you're kind of ex- it, it's like you know the um, pressing down the accelerator on a car that's not in gear you feel the, the wheels are turning and you're making a lot of smoke and a lot of noise we're not going anywhere and that's that's that was always the sort of the humiliation um that acceleration is sought to put on capitalism in general, no matter what you think of it, it was, okay, this is the situation we have. What if we put it in gear? Um, this ignores all of that in a way that I like can't wrap my head around because it just like, it contradicts itself constantly in a way that just then becomes immediately useless. Um, I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> I mean, the usage of Nietzsche is very fascinating to me because the figure of, he says, so in the section described as uh, the enemy, the enemy is given all these different, he says, we are enemies, not bad people, but rather bad ideas. You know, the limits of growth, existential risk, sustainability. And he says, now our enemy is um, stagnation, statism, authoritarianism, collectivism, central planning, socialism, being anti-ambition, anti-striving, and then all of these enemies, you know, the precautionary principle, um, which is designed to, you know, accelerate, he says deceleration, degrowth, depopulation, these are all the enemies. But the, then he sums up the enemy as Nietzsche's last man. Now, Nietzsche's last man is someone who believes that we've invented the prospects of human happiness, and all we need to do is produce more of the same. Produce more of the same shit again and again and again. Now, to quote the late, great Tony Negri and uh, Felix Guattari, who wants all of this shit? Because all that these people are looking to do is to find more ways to produce, because they, because Andreessen thinks that human needs and human capacities are more or less the same. Technology is just an extension of ourselves. We don't actually change that much. And all this abundance he wants to do, he says he wants to make everyone rich. He's basically saying he needs to find more ways to create abundances of the stuff we already have right now. Because the human, man is not something to be overcome for Andreessen. Man is something that needs to be accelerated. But the world needs to be made a world fit for people. And I mean, I think the manifesto format works quite well, even though this thing contradicts itself. Because in the section uh, before, the section called The Enemy, The Meaning of Life, he says, techno optimism is a material philosophy, not a political philosophy. We are not necessarily left wing, although some of us are. We are not necessarily right wing. Although some of us are. And then, of course, the enemy is socialism. And even, of course, to, to, to let the mask a bit more, he says, We believe America and her allies should be strong and not weak. We believe national strength, liberal democracies, flows from economic strength, financial power, cultural strength, soft power, 
and military strength, hard power. Economic, cultural, and military strength flow from technological strength. A technologically strong America is a force for good in a dangerous world. Technologically strong liberal democracies safeguard liberty and peace. Technologically weak liberal democracies lose to their autocratic rivals, making everyone worse off. What a load of utter bollocks. It is utter bollocks. The entire American empire, one runs on centralization, which is totally bad too. To say it's a material philosophy, there's nothing material about it. It's material, I mean, even Feuerbach couldn't fuck this up that much. It is truly, it doesn't think about the relations of production, it just thinks about production, it thinks about the treats, the stuff. It is Purely, I mean, at one point he says, you know, we need to make some things too cheap to meter, like pencils, because, you know, no one cares if you steal a pencil. No, 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 you probably don't care if anyone steals a pencil from you, because you're Marcus Andreessen. You are a venture capital billionaire who has nothing else to do, so he writes, you know, that's utter trash like this. I mean, this is absolutely, I mean, this, this constant thing of, this is probably the first time that Marcus Andreessen's ever felt a limit, because, you know, the, uh, he got rich on a, on a lucky dime with Netscape, and then, of course, finally, interest rates went up, and suddenly we have to attack the culture of limits, because the first time anyone's ever said no to this man. I mean, this manifesto isn't even new. I mean, if I read this out, a section from this manifesto, actually, made in the early 2000s, you know, to, to create a world fit for people, we need to mobilize all those who are not prepared to accept today's culture of limits. To this end, we need to wage a struggle of ideas against the conservative intellectual climate, which influences the entire political spectrum. A hundred years ago, it was the forces of religion which sought to hold back humanity's process. Today, the old religion has been discredited. Instead, we have new philosophies that denounce man's arrogance. Others question the role of science and knowledge and accuse humanity of going too far. Fashionable gurus advise that we should consume less and, rest and restrain our passions. Who's that, you ask? Living Marxism, the point is to change it. This is the same ideology which totally captured most of our intellectual institutions, and indeed a lot of the left at one point. And it is just this, we need to keep having more of the same, we cannot overcome ourselves, we have to keep making more of the same stuff. And to bring it down from Earth, because Mr. Andreessen seems to mostly invest in crypto bullshit and uh, AI, which is not AI. Where do these data sets come from? Well, they come, of course, from the production of weaponries. These technological weapons, which he admits flows from our technological prowess, these things are battle-tested in the imperialist frontiers. And as Matt, as you were saying, no, if you look at the frontier, the edge of the economy, it's not the market. It's in fucking Gaza. It's in Duff. It's in Sudan. It's in Congo. It's on every fucking border possible. The actual bloody borders, Mr. Andreessen. I mean, you know, he's got a big enough skull, surely he could fit that in there. Um, th this is absolutely the most... It is, it is pure ideology, to quote the gossip columnist Slavoj Žižek. It is absolute. The, the manifesto format is to give it a political edge, which it somehow tries to simultaneously deny. And of course, it's also quite a masturbatory exercise, because... How could, we can't say no to this philosophy because this man has billions upon billions of dollars. He can do what he wants. The only accelerationism that would be worth taking this down is like if you accelerate interest rates to the extent that him giving up this giving out this stuff will become far too expensive. It is truly a. I mean, it 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 is a act of rehashed, almost self parodic ideological myth making. And on that note, actually, I wanted to ask you, Craig, particularly about myth. Because this thing is soaked in mythology, not just in my sort of critical theory sense, oh, it's very mythological. No, it's there's not only Nietzschean myth here, there's also, of course, the myth of Prometheus, and mm. indeed a lingering absence of the myth of Icarus, which is essentially, you know, the shams of optimism in the face of technological prowess. Yeah, I actually... Yes, let's certainly talk about myth. And I, I think one of the ideological aspects of the manifesto and a mythological aspect of it as well is this idea of the frontier that you just brought up. The idea that a frontier for capital, for techno capital, is something that is politically neutral, 
is just an, an utter trash premise. And this is the, the exact ideology that's being deployed by the Zionists in Israel and their attempt to conquer and eradicate the Palestinian people. The idea, for example, well, there was never really a cohesive state before Israel. Therefore, Israel was justified in establishing itself on politically pristine territory. And, and, and this, is, this premise has been you know, evoked in, in the current discussion. Uh, thankfully, Israel's losing the propaganda war. And I think hopefully we're far beyond believing anything like that. But I think part of the myth, I mean, I mean there's a few different myths going on here. Uh, Andreessen himself evokes the myth of Prometheus right at the very beginning. And also mid, midway through the manifesto, he evokes the idea of a hero's journey where this idea that centers the myth of the ego, which espouses the notion that all that exists is the object of consumption or of conquest. And even those negative derivations of capital, such as depression or the negative externalities, the idea, for example, that that Andreessen puts forward is, look, look what the market has done. We have minimized carbon emissions X percent over so many years. And, and this shows, you know, the virtue and valor of the market. But for every one of those that we can say, there's, you know, at least three to 10 other, you know, sort of premises or other problems that ongoing capitalism has produced that the market has not been able to take care of microplastics. Uh, the idea that over the past, you know, since the 1970s, 69% of the wildlife on planet Earth has been eradicated. Species have gone extinct. I mean, the list goes on and on, climate change and, and so on. And so the idea, you know, just first and foremost, the idea of the hero, because Prometheus is a kind of hero too, but the idea that this hero orientation plugged into the market is going to be able to solve any or every problem is, I, I think, absolutely flawed. I mean, from, from a psychic perspective, from an, a psychological perspective, from an imagistic perspective, and also <clears throat> just given the truth of our life. Um, I, I would say, you know, here I'm thinking about somebody like James Hillman, for example, who notes that, you know, in Western society, particularly into the 20th century, this elevation of the hero archetype has been something that has brought about, you know, the very forces of totalitarianism and so on and so forth, because the, the hero archetype is the one that tends to stand above all of the other sort of imaginal dimensions of our life and, and conquer and colonialize them, essentially. Uh, this is something that I went over in the video that I put on uh, the Zero Books channel uh, regarding James Hillman. But you know, with that said, it, it, it makes me wonder, you know, th this idea of Prometheanism, and uh, here I'm thinking about Ray Brassier's work on it, the Prometheus Manifesto, and this is something that, you know, when when I first discovered it, I was I was quite attracted to, and I think there there might be something encoded into the European, the Anglo-American man, where yes, this idea of Prometheanism, we can capture the forces, we can seize the the power of technology and our ability to create technology and bend it towards, you know, these specific ends. Now, in as much as that might be true to a certain extent, it never gets over the notion of sovereignty and never gets over the notion of capital, the ways in which law, you know, the law of private property is constantly imposed in every new iteration of technology. With the emergence of fixed capital, for example, those forces come back into play in new and often more dangerous ways. You know, as, as we talked about the 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 uh, the creation of the data economy, for example, and, and the dangers that poses. And so, you know, in thinking about Prometheus and thinking about the hero, it makes me think like, is there a better myth? Um, I mean, Adam, you, you put the idea of Icarus for it. I mean, that that certainly might be an apt myth in, in Western uh, mythology to go to. But I was just kind of looking around my myth books thinking that, well, I'm, when I come to this discussion, I'd like to bring something other than the other, you know, the sort of normal boilerplate stuff that we use to to critique accelerationism, but I was looking at the myth of Wendigo, this um, indigenous people's myth in North, North America. It's familiar to the Algonquin tribe, the Cree, Cree tribes, and there's variations that that span all over North America. Mm -hmm. Did you all have Alvin Schwartz's scary stories to tell in the dark? Did you have that book? 
this hugely popular, <laughs> yeah, hugely popular book when I was young. And I think its popularity continued through the 90s and even into 2000s. If you go to the bookstore around Halloween time, it's always out. And there's one particular myth where uh, of this, this creature, the Wendigo, this beast. And in one of the tales, what it does is it pursues, well, the, one of the powers of the Wendigo is it has this insatiable hunger. And if it gets a hold of you, it will infect you with the same insa insatiable hunger and turn you essentially into a cannibal. And in fact, there's this, this, um, uh, this, this idea, the, the psychological notion that there's something called the Wendigo psychosis, uh, that was posited back in the 1800s, which was this, you know, absolutely false case study, quote unquote, of indigenous peoples who suffered from a kind of cannibalism. And, you know, the, these cases, it, it turned out that this wasn't true. These people, you know, were not affected by this. But it was interesting to see modern psychology turn the myth of the indigenous people back onto them, you know, to put them in the cast of the uncivilized barbarian brute. But what's interesting about it is in that projection, I think something like the Wendigo inhabits our will towards an accelerationist capitalism. In, in the story, in uh, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, the, the Wendigo chases its victim to the point it starts running so fast that the victim's feet start to burn up. And then when the Wendigo catches it, it makes it run even faster and faster and faster till its, its feet and legs completely burn up. And in the end of the tale, there, there was two people traveling together and one guy went missing. And like, where did he go? Did the Wendigo get him? And he, he saw a blanket lying on the ground. He's like, oh, he must be under the blanket over there. He pulls back the blanket and it's nothing but a pile of ash. And I thought that was a sort of like apt metaphor or apt myth to talk about the Wendigo. And also the idea that there is this, this demon or there is this entity that can infect you with an insatiable hunger, which is the one thing that capital absolutely does to us. I think to be encoded by the capitalist axiom is to, you know, as, Ad, as Adam pointed out, is to want all the treats. <laughs> and I think one of, uh, one of the things that, um, you know, I, I think I'm interested in not only philosophically, but politically is understanding what a post-capitalist or an anti-capitalist desire looks like. You know, how do we untether ourselves or unmoor ourselves from those tendencies to, to, to join forces with capital in having a, you know, an insatiable appetite for new commodities, you know, buying a new Amazon Kindle Paperwhite or whatever it is that you buy every year. And then those things go into the landfill and create, you know, the, the sort of spectral reality of all the trash and everything that we're leaving behind, which is this, this, this other sort of great myth that is developing, this idea of trash immortals and plastic ghosts. So I'm talking with Nicholas de warren who teaches at penn state and together we're going to do a little live event in, in state college in january where we're going to talk about this so i, I think there's a, a very interesting way to approach you know the issue of accelerationism and, and capitalism more broadly through this mythology but adam maybe you'll say something about icarus that's that's more interesting than that I'm just trying out a new technology he goes too close to the sun i mean that's just kind of it i mean to some extent this, if Icarus would apply if there was a new technology that would take us too close to the sun, but there isn't. These images sell just as well without the technology. Marcus Andreessen is, is a venture capitalist. He's making investments and he's trying to sell you on the investments he's making, particularly AI, by inflecting this, this whole moral nonsense. Um, AI is already on the way out, I think, partly because as we've seen with, with Twitter's new Grok AI, AI, this is a language model. These things are being fed stuff after the dawn of large language models, which basically gives them, I mean, it, it's very telling that they've, they just, they just spurt out crap now. They're just opinion aggregators, which feed on their own material. You feed cows their own cows. Um, Jason Sazelski over at This Machine Kills calls it Habsburg AI. Pretty true. I mean, this, this, I mean, the section I highlighted on, America and their allies being strong, not weak. That's in the section that's called technological values. One of the previous values is believe, we believe technologically is universalist. We do, technology doesn't care about your ethnicity, race, religion, national origin, the gender, sexuality, political views, height, weight, hair or lack thereof, 
Technology is built by a virtual United Nations of talent from all over the world. Anyone with a positive attitude and a cheap laptop can contribute. Technology is the ultimate open society. Again, this man does not understand technology. He does not understand. He, he, he thinks that ultimately technology has nothing to do with politics, that to, to draw up a diagram of a machine is the same thing as to already have it. There's no, uh, there's no real economy here. There's no politics of who gets to decide production. There's no history here either. It's just the eternal human essence, which is being held back by vacuous things. I mean, he says, for example, elites, people with luxury beliefs, good dog whistle there, in all of these kind of institutions are holding him back as the pioneer of, of you know, humankind. It's, like, it's very much this sci-fi myth going back to um, Isaac Asimov's Foundation trilogy, where there's just these groups of guys who just know what's good for us and will save humanity if we let them. And conveniently, here's a whole moral framework, so if you don't do that, you're actually killing yourself. Uh, it, it, it is truly... I'm trying to think of a better myth. I mean, maybe Tantalus, maybe? I mean, I I I Icarus would be... I mean, I Icarus did fly for a bit. He just flew too close to the sun. What's flying here? What's, what are the wings here? Other than this is a plea for to, uh, to embrace this man's investments. I, I, I think, personally, though, I think that, listeners, if, if you're willing, you should, you should read this manifesto, because, if anything, the tools of not only sort of our work, but especially Matty's work as well, have given us tools to understand cybernetics and capital in such a way that, you know, this, for this, you can sort of flex, scratch your old intellectual muscles and also have a bloody good laugh at looking at it. Because this is a multi-billionaire deriding the elites and constantly tripping over his own words, trying to talk about universality. I mean, if, te if technology it doesn't care about who you are and everything, what, what is technology? It's just this floating idea of the human essence. It's got no social relations in it. It's, it's outside of the planet. And when he's or outside of us, and when he says that our job now as techno optimists is to become fully human, I mean, what does that, does that mean that if you're the less aligned of you are with this, the less human you are? And to him, that does make, yeah, that does mean that. Because our life is a, he says humans are you know, an amazing resource, an energy source, and collectively our moral duty is to accelerate this stuff, which means to offer ourselves, our labor time to it. And to it, it doesn't exist. What that means, you're giving it to Mark Andreessen and his mates, and all the systems, and of course the American Empire, which is needed for this. It, it is a, a beautiful plea for the status quo trying to get more money for itself. And it's, I mean, I can't believe that this thing has actually made me feel sorry for, for Nick Land, that he now has degraded himself so much that these are the sort of people who read him. Nick, maybe you can redeem yourself. You can come back. Paradise regained, you know. No, he there is a, he's too racist. Th there is a bit in this that I think that, <clears throat> and I guess it's the, there's this glimmer maybe in that. Because, I mean, it, obviously, it's, yeah, it's, it's useless and, and, and frames that's, it, 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 there's like a desire to not to respond to this by saying, uh, like I know you are, but what am I? Sort of five, where all the people that it puts up as enemies seem to be the people that are aligned with this movement. Like you know, yeah, as you were saying, Adam, about Nietzsche's last man. Mark here sounds like Nietzsche's last man to me. Um, but there's, but there is this kind of sort of um, tense relationship with some of the gambits that accelerationism at least initially puts forward. I think that's kind of what Craig with your when to go myth example is kind of a good, I think it's a really great way of, of framing it in a way. And, and a lot of the left accelerations and stuff, and especially Mark Fisher's stuff, would try to redress that, right? To say that, you know, okay, if we have this insatiable desire for things that leads to a kind of cannibalism, well, what if we had, what is, what, what if under this system that, 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 um, kind of enforces an insatiable desire for things, or at least for commodities. What if commodities were replaced with communism? If it, where you have like an, uh, an, an insatiable desire that becomes a revolutionary impulse, using the kind of libidinal mechanisms of capitalism to desire something other than itself. Um, but that seems like most, that, that's another thing that's kind of undermined here. And I guess, like, I think also for what you were saying, Adam, the, 
And maybe I think what's the most embarrassing part of this manifesto is that section, the meaning of life, which you've quoted from already. But that bit where he talks about techno-optimism is a material philosophy, not a political philosophy. Um, material abundance from markets and technology opens the space for religion, for politics, and for the choice of how to live socially individually, which again, there's, there's an in, inherent contradiction there. But then I guess it's, it asks what kind of, you know, what, what is this material philosophy? Is it just materialistic or is it materialism? And there is this, that's always been the sort of strange gambit of left accelerationism, which was often also dismissed on, from the left as being too technocratic. And this is definitely technocratic. But the idea that materialism is inherently political, because uh, if, if, if we consider any political philosophy as the consideration of how best to organize and manage life, which is, I guess, in this sense, this kind of amorphous human essence, but really is matter, if we're, some of us are still Marxists over here, um, there's this sense that materialism has always been Promethean. Marxism is Promethean in that it seizes the means of production, but this is doing something else entirely. But there is this, yeah, there's this sense that these, some of these myths that are here are strangely appropriate, but just hollowed out of any of their edge. And yeah, I think it's the, there's, there's that, there, the, the, it's, it, it, it's almost, it, it, in making it, yeah, I also feel quite bad for Nick Lands in this respect, but I guess precisely because to really want to shit on this, and it really makes it easy to do so, it's, there's this sense of not wanting to sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater, sort of say that we can't enjoy things, we can't be optimistic. But Mark Andreessen is not the person whose optimism that she, we should be following, right? It's the, and I guess it's what, as, as you were saying as well, Craig, about you know, the, where, where these borders, these peripheries are, who is, who is necessarily having to think of a better future here the, uh, uh, the, in a way that does not sort of be, uh, is under the, the thrall or even under the sort of, I mean, you know, he talks here about um, taking the boot off the neck of things so we can all be rich um, when the boot is precisely the markets that, he's uh, insisting on uh, deference to um you know if there's a if there's a techno optimism it is in this kind of it's 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 the things that that are um that yeah like israel is using to denounce hamas and gaza as a whole right the way that apparently these this, this these 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 terrorists have been repurposing things that we are now aware Israel gave them in the first place, this network of tunnels, this guerrilla networks, these, these weapons that they shouldn't have, the money that they shouldn't have. It's sort of things that have been siphoned off by a, a suppressed people from the, the boot that is on their neck, used against the boot itself. Um, that's the kind of, like, I think, the, uh, as much as it feels quite um, provocative to suggest that, you know, a Palestinian independence movement has any kind of resonance with accelerationism. That is a kind of accelerationist um, praxis, anti-praxis, anti-production even, I think. Um, uh, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's sort of so disappointing as someone that's definitely spent quite a few years writing about accelerationism as it, and it's kind of, you know, last gasp of, of political relevance, at least within the sort of theory sphere, um, to see that excised completely. But I agree with you, Adam, that it's definitely worth listening this reading through this, if only because the, ga the gaps and the contradictions that are so apparent, you know, in, it's in those, in, in, in what feels so, what's, what's so bizarre about this new accelerationist manifesto is the gaps and contradictions that are so apparent, the things that aren't here or that don't make sense, is, is where they've evacuated accelerations and proper. It's not, a, it, it, we've, there's people online for, for years now have, have, have tarnished things that claim the accelerations name, um, but humiliate its initial proposals. Nothing does that quite as effectively as this does. Um, and so it's quite an interesting, 
it's hardly generative and productive, but yeah, the the, the it's it's really the negative of all the, the the sort of perfect negative image of all that it once was. Um, it is. The, it is. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. That was it. <laughs> It, it, it is fascinating to me how much, just in my studies of the early accelerationist stuff, how much the positivity of accelerationism is tied to the classical Marxist theme of the self-abolition to proletariat. The accelerationism is a drive towards a self-abolition of the subject, the bourgeois human that is currently constituted by its own social relations. This, does, as it, this doesn't want to overcome a human. There is no overcoming of the, there's only an overcoming of the limits that, let's be honest, people online tell these people that they shouldn't do. They think, oh, I don't want to, I don't, I want to keep, you know, for example, I had a good example from politics today. Well, not quite today, a couple of years ago. Boris Johnson, the Tory government's whole investment in, so instead of doing uh, green technology, instead of doing an, like a whole technical revolution of getting rid of fossil fuels, divesting from them, the idea was carbon capture technology. The idea is there, the idea sells, and therefore we have to accelerate investment in that because then we can still do carbon, but then the carbon gets captured and we just need more investment. We keep doing fossil fuel investments in order to invest in carbon capture technology. This is the carrot and stick, really, but it's not just a carrot, it's not even a carrot anymore, it's just an image of a carrot for certain investors. And there's certain things to get us all tied into them. The, the ironically, and this isn't a, this might be a sort of a, a shortening of, of Ben Noy's critique of accelerationism from which we get the term accelerationism. It's this lack of negativity. Whereas actually, if you actually want to see an accelerationism without negativity looks like, we've got it. It's effectively, and I mean that very much in the double, double sense of the pun, it has abolished the abolitionism in accelerationism. And all it's, acceler it's not just accelerating, it's just increasing. It's not even, what, what is it accelerating? It, it's, it's a law of magnitude increase. There's no qualitative change there. Yeah, the, the Stern has said, you know, the, the men of the future will, will, will fight their way to a freedom we won't, we won't even miss. Whereas, what is the freedom here apart from being more of the same? And, read, and said, okay, you all get some. You just need to invest in, conveniently, all of my stuff. There is um, one little addition that I wanted to add here, which I think is quite useful. Um, and I guess we, we, we initially suggested that we were going to have this conversation, right? Um, because Forbes has just published this uh, interview with um, the person that um, Mark Andreessen calls the patron saint of technical optimism, which is this Twitter account based Beth Jezos that you mentioned before. And Forbes has identified this person as um, former Google quantum computing engineer, Guillaume Verdon. Um, and there's a few quotes that uh, the, the article is very, very short. It's not really. It's also very confused. There's a there's a there's a, her, a, tor a, a terrible reductionist version of um, hyperstition in there that makes me want to punch myself in the face. Um, but just the pull quotes for that article are very interesting. I think, and I just wanted to say that. There's, and I think it, that even just reading a few of them summarizes your point, but which I totally agree with. Um, but Guillaume's sort of quote is saying. We're trying to solve culture by engineering, whatever that means. How do you solve culture? Um, and there's a little interview. It's, uh, Benjamin Noyes is, 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 um, is interviewed for this piece too. Um, Noyes is, is often interviewed because he coined the term accelerationism, at least it's like blogosphere usage in 2008. Um, though I don't think he's the best commentator on this anymore, or even if he ever was, I don't know. But you know, no offense, Ben. Um, but he sort of says, yeah, you create an idea, you don't have anything to show anyone, and the idea somehow becomes real, so does the money. This, this sense of the cultural engineering is simply just startups, which is depressing. But the best commentator, I think, in this piece, which sort of contradicts that sense that we're going to solve culture by engineering, is Fred Turner, professor of communication at Stanford. And his comment on this whole movement is, the truth is they have no social vision. There's this strange sense of solving culture through engineering when I don't think they have any actual idea of what culture is. Um, and as much as there's this, this in the manifesto, there's this insistence that, um, you know, markets are kind of these individualistic entities in the kind of very, you know, not just Protestant and liberal, classically liberal, but also neoliberal sense. Um, 
markets are yeah they're individualistic entity or individualistic principles that have collective implications. But again, there's no it's a, it's a completely voided sense of what that collectivity is. And I think if there's any way of sort of saying this, like um, this sort of Deluso Thatcherism, which is just Thatcherism with all Deluso Guattarianness removed, um, there is this sense of you know what's the, the Thatcher quote? There's no such thing as society, just individuals and families. Um, but here we don't even have that. Um, it's it's there's, there's no such thing as society. There is just ideas about startups. That's and that's it, it's it's like a, I think I think it makes, that's what I said before. Right? It's 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 Thatcherism, which was a crime of mood. I think it's even probably a kind of horribly reductive version of Thatcherism. It makes me feel sorry for Margaret Thatcher all of a sudden too. It's that. Let's not go too uh, avoided. Okay. Well, I know. <laughs> you, 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 you don't actually have to hand it to Margaret Thatcher, let's make that clear. <laughs> but it's so voided of any kind of like. I mean, and that's the strange thing. Like, there's, there's, uh, I, in, in wanting to try and explain it and give a sense of it, I don't want to give them more credit than they're, they're due and put words in their mouth. It's like it voids it of all value. But then this manifesto talks about value, and I kind of want that. It needs to define a lot of its terms. What is it thinking about in terms of value? It's just supposed to be the value form. Um, it has, it, and I think that's what Craig said. You, you said that at the beginning, right? This is just pure business ontology. Which actually seems to just, or just just business. It doesn't even have to seem to have a sense of ontology at all. Um, well, I think that's the interesting thing. There, there, there's a kind of revenant quality to this theory. We're, we're getting a diminished version of Nick Land, of Margaret Thatcher, in this sort of zombified form of accelerationism. Or, uh, as I said, it, it, there's a, a sort of self-help element. To, to things here that that kind of really cheapens things, you know. Just to to quickly finish up the the myth talk a little bit. I mean, right from the get go, the very first quote: "You live in a deranged age." I I, I mean, right off the bat, th this is something that we didn't talk about. It, it starts off with an ableist accusation, you know, that we are the insane ones, we're crazy, and embedded within this is this figure of the barbarian, whose death or martyrdom at the at at the hands of those wielding nuclear bomb, you know, have given us, you know, the, the fortuitous growth that capitalist technology has allowed us to achieve. What, what, what's happening with this theory? It, what it's doing is it's suppressing the fact of the social. That's what it wants to do. It, it, it will not allow the fact of the social to, to present itself in the form of any kind of resistance. In fact, it, it presupposes the venality of any sort of action that happens outside of the market. And, and that's what we really need to take heed with when, when we come to these accelerationist philosophies is like, what is being elided? What's being bracketed out? What's being demonized here? And very specifically in the Andreessen case, it is that. It's those forces that would call for boycott, divest, sanction. It's those voices that would interrupt the lobbyist movement, you know, that basically clogs up the courts. And, you know, that's 98 to 99 percent of the laws. You know, if you think law is an effective mechanism with which to produce some sort of social change, well, you can't because the market's in there. And it's in that sense, you know, I, 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 I positively uphold the figure of the barbarian insofar as that is the person who is positioned as a figure of resistance, who's, who's able to insert themselves anywhere within the system of axioms and, and trouble them and disrupt them. That's that thing right, right at the start, too, where they talk about, well, I guess it's throughout, there's the, the section on lies. Um, I can't see any lies there, really. Um, but then there's this, that's sort of set up to be this dismissal of both communists and Luddites, which I think are both mentioned explicitly somewhere in the manifesto. But it's, it's, it's that kind of, it, 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 it betrays this terrible lack of self-awareness in that same respect that you're just talking about, I suppose, right? It's like the, the Luddite response is precise, it's not a problem with the technology itself, but who owns it or who's in charge of that technology. And so when technology just becomes this byword for capitalism, sort of system, systemic desire for more and more profit, um, which I guess is kind of like, you know, profit's a word that's, that's um, strangely absent from this, but seems to be the main concern. It really makes that, you know, that old William Gibson line, 
the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. That still holds true, I think, but nowhere more so than in a manifesto like this, where you have yeah, this, this billionaire identifying the, the enemies of social progress as anyone that would step, stand in their way. And yet the, 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 the idea of progress offered is just embarrassingly unimaginative and even backwards, um, paradoxically. Um, it, it, it's, 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 it's so, and it, it's, it's just like it, all of this crumbles as soon as if, if, you, if you imagine a world in which they would have any sort of self-awareness. Um, but self-awareness is something deferred to AI, I guess, <laughs> in the future. They long for AI to have self-awareness, but they've got no idea, of, no, no, no desire to have any self-awareness for themselves. That is the tragedy. They, they uphold Nietzsche as the sort of avatar, but yet one of the highest values they espouse within the manifesto is to be useful, you know, and, and that's it, to, to recuperate the market. I'm sorry, Adam, go for it. Hmm. I know, well, one day, maybe, this is the tragedy of this, this, this manifesto, because it is ultimately about intelligent machines and accelerating towards their production, and yet this manifesto has proven that we will never, ever make a machine that is as smart as how, Mar as how smart Mark Andreessen thinks he really is. Completely speculative, complete nonsense, folks. Fully automated, luxury, well, God knows what at this point. Half hour mark. We all drive ourselves and you, the dear listener, completely off the rails into a fully detorialized, speculative, accelerationist spiral. I just want to thank Maddie again for coming on. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to tear my hair out with you both. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you again. And if people want more Ax stuff, of course, we have also, if this does go out during the sale, repeat, have a sale half off on Antioculus, half off of Maddie's book. So we've got Egress on Morning Melancholy and Mark Fisher, their new book, Narcissus in Bloom, and of course, the post capitalist desire lectures. And if you want more accelerationism, we've got stuff, we've got Fedorov, we got Plenty of other episodes of Matt Elon, Mark Fisher, and Accelerationism generally in the back catalogue. We got Return of the Mac, a survey of left accelerationism. And of course, next year, we've got our cybernetic books out from Ian Allen Paul, my introduction to Mark Fisher's Flatline Constructs, and in my other solo work, The New Flesh. And on that note, uh, we'll catch you folks later.